Okay, I think uh, I think we'll begin. Uh, as more people will join us shortly, I think. So hello and welcome to this webinar about the COVID-19 Audience Outlook Monitor. This is the fourth in our weekly series and today's topic is First Nations Arts and Audiences with hosts Wesley Enoch, Sydney Festival Director and Chair of the First Nations Arts Strategy Panel at the Australia Council and Tandy Palmer-Williams, Managing Director of Pattern Makers, the agency that delivered this research tool. I'm Chris Pope, Research Programme Manager at the Australia Council, and we're very happy to be running this webinar today, and a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us this morning. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm coming to you today, the Garigal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd also like to acknowledge the many nations throughout Australia that we're gathering from, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future, and to all First Nations people present and online in this session. As we know, arts communities across the country and around the world have been devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Necessary restrictions on public gatherings and travel have resulted in the closure of cultural venues and the cancellation or postponement of events and programmes. There are particular concerns for First Nations arts and culture where protecting elders, preventing loss of cultural knowledge and ensuring well-being are priorities. As restrictions continue to ease and institutions begin to reopen, many people are now needing to make critical decisions and plan for the future. So today we'll be exploring results of the Audience Outlook Monitor from the perspectives of both First Nations respondents to the survey and also the audiences for First Nations work. From the Australia Council's National Arts Participation Survey, we know that the majority of Australians agree that First Nations arts are an important part of Australian culture, and there is a growing interest and attendance uh, at First Nations arts events and festivals. The Audience Outlook Monitor is providing vital information not only on when these audiences will be ready to return to public spaces and under what circumstances, but also on how audiences are currently engaging with arts and creativity online. This will be hugely important as we navigate the coming months and the Council was very keen to support pattern makers in delivering this important research tool, as were many of our state funding agency colleagues. So I'll hand over to Wesley now to kick off today's discussion, uh, but before I do, a quick note on registering questions. Please feel free to start sending questions through and if you could please use the Q&A button to do that. The chat function is also there for you to use for general discussion throughout today's session, and we encourage you to do that. But we'll be taking questions from the Q&A section. Uh, and now it's over to you, Wesley. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, great to have so many people here as well. There's about- oh, Wesley, I think you're on mute. <laughs> uh, no, no, I can hear Wesley. No, no, I'm always <laughs> sorry, sorry, it's okay, I can hear you. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're right. Um, so, yeah, goodness, we're, we're becoming so much better at all these things now. I, I've actually been thinking about how this massive kind of upgrade, if you like, of how we're all kind of working um, and how we're getting better and better at using these technologies. It's, it's pretty amazing. And also to see in First Nations environments how these technologies are really opening up, especially online sales. I've been very interested to see how a number of bodies like um, the Cairns Indigenous Art Fair and also the Darwin Art Fair, the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair, are going to be looking at more online uh, processes and looking at how they can develop, not just because it's COVID-19 and post or living with COVID-19, but also saying this is maybe a way of the future, how we can look at this time as a big upgrade in the way we kind of consider in engaging in the world, especially rural and remote communities, especially those who are kind of slightly um, uh, distanced. Uh, also, we, we've experienced now with, uh, as Chris was saying about elders, that I know on Stradbrook Island, where my family come from, um, we closed the island down to look after elders, to make sure that they weren't exposed to uh, COVID-19. And, and it was quite successful. But what does it mean for the economies? What does it mean for those who are kind of interested in, in connecting with First Nations artists and First Nations audiences? Um, I'm also fascinated to see, and I, Tandy and I had a little conversation the other day, 
about sometimes a lot of the First Nations um, arts and cultural activities can be seen in the tourism sector rather than the arts and culture sector. And though we, we can, we'll talk a little bit about that, um, some of this material may not be that, that specific to, um, to the tourism sector. But it'd be interesting, especially if you've had some, uh, some work out there in, in, in across the country where you're working in a tourism sector, that could be interesting to hear about too, about whether there's something that you've noticed it, given that the, the domestic and international tourism obviously has disappeared, how has that affected the arts and culture? Could be interesting to see as well. Hey, we've done a little bit of a poll, which we'll do now just to see who's in the room. Um, I'm gonna ask for that poll to come up. So you can just use your cursor here to, to answer it. Um, so quickly, you know, do you identify as First Nations? Um, and this is multiple choice, so you can choose many of these. Uh, do you work in an organization that presents First Nations works? Um, do you attend First Nations art regularly? Do you, uh, have you engaged in art, First Nations art online during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, are you a First Nations artist or are you other? You know, very broad thing, are you other? But <laughs> you get the sense of it at least. Um, so everyone gets a chance just to, you can answer this as many ways as you want. Uh, you can tick as many boxes as you like. Um, so hopefully you've all had a bit of a go at that. We'll just give you 30 seconds. And this sense too, just seeing who's in the room, because I noticed there was lots of people working in the policy area, in government area, and a couple of venues as well um, around the country, seeing that, that where, you're, where you're coming there. We might see what the results of that poll are. Let's have a, have a little look. Do, 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 do. Here we go. Okay, so... Oh, so many of you working for uh, an organisation that prevent, that presents First Nations work and you attend regularly. Oh, that's interesting to see. And many of you coming from other, wherever other is. <laughs> um, that's really interesting because I think just talking with Tandy earlier too, this, there's a sense of um, real engagement uh, pre-COVID that's kind of lasting through this kind of COVID experience. Anyway, we won't get into too much detail, but I, I love this idea that there's a kind of loyalty that I'm reading in the data, but also a sense too of many of the relationships the audiences are having, especially in a digital environment, are mediated through a large organization or um, a trusted brand in some, some way. So especially if you're working for a, a large organization, a, a, a large company or a, an art center, what role you can play in helping support more First Nations activity. You anyway, know, some more interesting things to come through. I mean, I've had a little look at this material. It's a lot of material and so fascinating because as a First Nations artist, we, we very rarely get to see the inside workings of uh, how people are thinking about their, the, their engagement, their loyalty. And so I'm, I'm fascinated to hear a little bit more from Tandy and she talks us through this material. Tandy, great to have you. You've been oh, doing thanks. movies now, haven't you? God. <laughs> Yeah, so um, hello everyone. For those I haven't met yet, I'm Tandy Palmer-Williams, Managing Director at Pattern Makers, which is the research agency specialising in culture, creativity and community. So um, really it's a pleasure to, I'm coming from um, on Gurungai country today and um, yeah, just want to share my acknowledgement of the traditional owners and to any First Nations people here, welcome. Um, and if you'd like to, um, please do introduce yourself in the chat. Um, I noticed lots of people ticked other. So if you, um, you know, would like to explain what brings you here, that'd be great. And if you have an acknowledgement of your own to share today, um, please do. It's always nice to hear from you out there in the chat. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So um, in a moment, you should see my slides and a picture of Cairns Indigenous Art Fair. Let's see if this works. Right. So thanks, Wesley, and to the Australia Council and to all of you for it really it is a privilege to connect with you today on this topic um, to talk about two of the most important groups to Australia's cultural life, in my opinion. Um, so that's First Nations people, First Nations audiences and audiences for First Nations work. Um, 
from all of us at Pattern Makers and our research partner, Wolf Brown, who's the international leader of this study. Um, it's really an honour to be working with you in this way to try and support good decision making in, you know, an incredibly challenging time. So thanks for coming today. So we'll be sharing some data about the, from the Audience Outlook Monitor, which is a cross-sector collaborative data collection exercise. Um, it's involved 159 different organisations from all across the country. Um, and for more information about the background of the study and exactly how the data was collected, you can visit our website. Um, my colleague Bianca Mullet is with us today. She's going to be popping some links and answering some questions as we go through. Um, so Bianca can share a link to where you can find some more information about it. But basically, we've heard from 23,000 audience members across the country. 159 different organisations and then we aggregate all that data into a dashboard which um, is freely accessible to you at any time um, and that dashboard gives us this picture of audience members across the country kind of unlike anything we've ever seen before and it gives us the ability to zoom in on different groups so for the past few weeks we've been um, doing a deep dive on different segments and today we're obviously here to talk about First Nations audiences. Um, so the two groups that we're going to be talking about are the respondents who've identified as First Nations themselves. So we have a small sample of um, people, 177 people nationally identified as either Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander or both. Um, and then we've got a, a quite a large group who identify themselves as audiences for First Nations work. So they've attended either a First Nations performing arts event or a visual arts event in 2019. So 24% of our sample of audience members said that they've attended um, either of those First Nations Performing Arts or Visual Arts um, in 2019. And, and as a group, they have some characteristics which are different to other audiences. So just want to be clear before we get into the data that uh, when we say audience members, we're talking about the study was set up really as a database survey. So these are people who appear in the databases of our kind of you know, publicly funded arts and cultural institutions. So they're people who buy tickets, who are in um, e-newsletter databases, that, that kind of thing. So they're not representative of the general population. And when we talk about First Nations respondents, the findings aren't, you know, um, reflective of First Nations peoples generally. Um, we are hearing from that uh, segment of past attendees. So we wanted to really define this study as focusing on people who've attended an arts and cultural event in the past two years. So what did we find out? When it comes, we'll talk about First Nations respondents first. So basically um, what we found, and I'll show a slide here on, on screen now, which shows that First Nations respondents as a group um, are ready to start attending events sooner than other audience segments. So when we ask what statement kind of best describes how you feel about going out again to cultural events, what we heard is that, um, you know, among all audiences, 22%, so around one in five, say they're ready to attend as soon as it's permitted. Um, among First Nations responded, that's a bit higher, so it's 27%, you can see in the dark blue on the screen. Um, and across a range of different measures. So when we look at, you know, the level of comfort attending different types of, of events and venues, um, we can see that First Nations respondents are slightly more comfortable um, and they're more likely to say that they're making plans to attend in future. And our interpretation of this is that First Nations respondents as a group place a high value on cultural events and see them as more kind of essential and, and want to be back at um, attending as soon as possible. So um, there's, there's something else that we need to talk about in relation to how First Nations respondents feel about attending events. And to do that, I'm going to show you some results about our First Nations respondents, their feedback on venue safety measures. Um, and there's a range of different um, data points that we've got in the dashboard and in the overall audience reporting, which you can read about in terms of venue safety measures. But we've asked about a whole lot of different things like hand sanitizer and social distancing and all that kind of thing. And then we ask, you know, overall, how much will these kinds of measures um, affect your decision to attend in future? And what we heard um, is that overall among all audiences, you know, 96% say 
that those types of measures will positively influence a decision to attend. When we look at First Nations respondent, it's, it's slightly less. So um, it's more like 95%. So still overwhelmingly, you know, First Nations respondents do care about venue safety measures. Um, but there's a few indications that it's not as strongly held. It's not seen as, as important. And when we did a bit of digging to, you know, to try and discover what's going on behind this, we've heard a couple of different things. So um, basically some respondents explained to us that they're kind of philosophical about attending and sort of a little bit less anxious about some venue safety measures. So one person said, I'm a positive person and what will be will be. Um, but some First Nations respondents explain um, that they personally won't be per positively influenced by venue safety measures because those kinds of measures, um, they, they basically perceive a risk from the virus in their communities um, and set venue safety measures won't make a difference to alleviating that risk. So we've all heard about how some people are asymptomatic and, um, you know, there's, there's even... Um, the most stringent venue safety measures couldn't 100%, um, you know, reduce the risk of transmission. If the virus is in the community, there may be still some risk. And some people say that, um, you know, for that reason, they won't be back. Um, and so I'm just going to show one of the comments up on screen um, that sort of illustrates what one person's feelings on this were. So they've said, I'm in a high risk group, as are most of the artists and arts workers that I usually work with. And their care and safety is a high priority for me as we can't afford to lose our old people and their irreplaceable knowledge. So um, we know that in this sample of First Nations respondents that as a group, they're slightly more likely to ex you know, to experience an underlying health condition or be close to someone who does. And so there's a segment that are kind of deeply cautious right now. Um, so we've got these two things going on. On the one hand, um, this is a group that place a very high value on culture and see it as essential and want to come back, you know, sooner than others. And then, and then at the same time, part of this group um, do perceive, um, you know, themselves or someone in the community as particularly vulnerable and so um, are a little bit more risk averse at this time. So um, two things going on there. In terms of what we're seeing at, um, you know, in terms of how people are participating um, during, at home during the pandemic, it's quite interesting. I, I expected um, that digital technology may be um, kind of less of a thing right now for um, for First Nations respondents, um, and that was, um, in fact, not true. Um, so compared with other audiences, the First Nations respondents in our sample um, are highly engaged with creativity um, at home. They're highly engaged online just as much as other audience members. Um, and, in fact, there's a group who um, have discovered participating online and want that to continue um, alongside the reopening of venues and events. So I'm showing another quote up on screen now from someone who said, um, I am disabled and found it hard to attend before the epidemic. Now abled people are finally realising that there are ways to help us be included, even if we can't leave our house. Please keep that going. Not all of us will have a normal to return to. We never did. So um, what we found across our sample of all, all audience members is that um, there's a group who want digital participation to remain an option to them, um, regardless of kind of what happens with the reopening. Um, and we see that um, some people want it to be offered alongside a physical attendance opportunity. Um, so that even if something happens between the point where they bought the ticket and, and the actual event, they have um, the flexibility to, if they themselves didn't feel well or there was an outbreak or something happened, that they could have the option to still participate online and that that might provide some reassurance to actually go ahead and buy a ticket. Um, so when we ask about this offering it both online and in physical experiences, there's some segments of the community um, and our, you know, audience sample that want that online experience to be an option. And, and that is for people, it's higher among people who live in regional remote areas, um, who experience a disability, who have caring responsibilities. So, um, and, and that's held amongst um, First Nations respondents as well. So um, I think there's a reason 
um, there's good cause in this data to be thinking about our digital channels and our digital offerings, um, you know, as a long term, you know, thinking for long term, how are we going to provide these? Um, because to an extent, um, I think they need to be thought about in terms of providing access um, for some audience segments throughout the rest of the pandemic and potentially beyond as well. Tandy, I'm really interested in this as an yes. idea too. This, I mean, one of the questions we've got to ask as, as First Nations makers, makers of mm. performing arts in particular, like should we be making less and making sure that we're distributing it more? Like this kind of distribution through the digital form becoming more and more important as, as we move, move on, as we talked about earlier. Yeah, potentially. I mean, I think there's certainly, I think we need to be, try and be really smart about what we're producing for online. And certainly um, one of the things we found is that it doesn't need to be actually streamed live, like the performance, you know, it doesn't have to be live, live um, for it to feel live and exciting for an audience member. So there's ways for us to be creating, I think, you know, evergreen content yeah. experiences that are really good quality um, but that will have a life beyond a, a much longer shelf life than um, you know a physical performance or a live streamed performance so we can um, I, I think it's we need to be as this goes on need to be thinking strategically and making long-term planning decisions to make really good quality things that can last um, a long time Sure. Um, and that potentially, you know, thinking about the balance of our investment is really important. And I um, hope that as a sector, we'll start to see, um, you know, I think it's great that there's quick response grants and that kind of thing that have been um, there for artists to adapt what they're doing for an online audience. But um, as think time goes on, I, I want to make sure that as a sector, we're, um, thinking about those really high quality experiences and that take it to the next level kind of thing. Um, so that, yeah, so that we are going to be meeting audience needs, you know, from these different segments well into the future, definitely. And that issue of monetizing that, is there a price point? Is there, is there, you know, like, like it, during the pandemic, there's been a lot of stuff going out for free, um, and very, very little kind of premium experiences that people are prepared to pay for. And you just go, oh, for me, it just kind of reiterates there's no value to these things when things are given away for free. But, and in a First Nations environment too, we're, we're so community focused, we just, we keep giving it away for free all the time. And maybe, maybe we just have to accept that and go, well, let's do more free things then. Well, I think it's about, um, and we've got some more data for you on this, Wesley, um, that we'll come to in a bit, but, um, I think free content is playing an important role for audience access right now. So we are seeing, um, I mean, obviously in this group, we don't need to linger on the fact that it's not sustainable for us to provide all our content for free at all. Um, but let me say that there, there is a benefit being created for audience members from all this free content. So we know that um, some audience members have during the pandemic sampled a broader range of things than they would have otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this kind of audience development thing happening where people are discovering new artists and artworks and perhaps taking a chance on things that they wouldn't otherwise because it's free and because the commitment from them, they can basically do it in their lounge room kind of thing and have quite a social experience and it's not as big a risk for them to go out and try something new. So we've seen that. In, we've heard that in relation to, say, Bangara, for instance, where people have, you know, known about it but never, you know, got to a performance and actually during the pandemic they have. Um, so I think there is a benefit for audiences and we've heard from people who um, are economically challenged right now that having free content available has meant an enormous amount to them. So, however, I think it's important to think about free content as, you know, strategically so that it's you know perhaps opening a doorway for somewhere but that there is a pathway to for that audience member to go on a journey um, to register their interest to stay involved with the, or the organizations that they discover and for us to build a, an actual market over time so it's not just pumping out for endless free content but it's using free content um, as 
a piece of our, you know, our, our portfolio that really makes sense and that is um, funneling people into a deeper um, means of engagement. So I'm not just socialist, though. I want everything to be free. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's not actually... Well, that's a conversation <laughs> for another day, perhaps. Yes, maybe. Anyway, um, let's but, yes, going. I want to talk about First Nations audiences more in a moment, but one more thing before we move on about First Nations respondents is that among those who are participating online right now, and we've talked about how they're just as likely as other audiences to be doing that, um, they're more likely to be driven to do that for their own well-being. Um, so we're seeing that that's a stronger motivator than other for audience segments that they're actually um, doing it for themselves to feel um, culturally enriched and to support their you know mental health and well-being. So um, I think that digital technology is kind of more important than perhaps I first thought for this group. Um, I want to turn to audiences for First Nations work now. So this is the 24% or we've got about 5,500 people who attended First Nations Visual Arts or Performing Arts in 2019. Um, I'm actually going to show you, jump into the dashboard to show you this group. So some of you will recognise um, the dashboard, others may be seeing it for the first time. So what I will do is first share the right window. Um, so basically, there's some characteristics of First Nations audiences. So let me rephrase. Audiences for First Nations work um, have some characteristics which are different to other audience members. So, for instance, um, this group of audience members is very highly educated um, and, and more so than other arts audiences. So they're even more likely to have a postgraduate degree. Um, they have a slightly younger age profile than the other audiences in our sample. Um, they attend a range of art forms more frequently. They're more likely to actually earn a living through the arts themselves compared to other audiences. And they're highly likely to be, you know, being creative themselves um, during the pandemic. So this is a particularly um, highly engaged group of people um, that strategically I think is very, very important for our sector. Um, so into the dashboard, uh, Bianca can pop a link to this for anyone who hasn't hopped on board the dashboard. And there is a dashboard video tour available if you want to find out more about how to navigate it. But basically when you first um, log in, you'll see, I'm just going to adjust this so I can see what I'm doing. You'll see this screen um, and there's a number of different reports that you can access. What I'm going to do is just dive into demand for live events. Um, and I'm going to show you some filters so you can click on and off the state that you're interested in. I, I'm just going to keep the national results um, on and I'm going to show them all together rather than splitting the states out um, individually. Um, and then in terms of the filtering, what I'm going to do to show First Nations audiences is go to type of arts and culture attended in the past, grouped. So this will actually display... Um, First Na audiences for First Nations work, whether that was visual arts or performing arts. If you want to look at those separately, um, it takes a little bit longer to load, so I won't show it right now, but if you just go to types of arts and culture attended, um, then you can explore First Nations visual arts and First Nations performing arts separately. Um, and then to apply your filters, you always need to tick apply options. So coming down, um, I'll just show you some of these measures, which is in the past fortnight, did you do any of the following activities? So right now, overwhelmingly, um, sorry, when I say right now, this data was collected in mid-May, so between the 6th and the 14th of May. Um, and we're coming up to actually the second phase of data collection in the next few weeks. So um, when you... Uh, if you want to check back in a, in a few weeks' time, you'll be able to see how these measures have shifted. Um, but at the time of data collection, no one was really attending anything. Um, a small number of people were actually making firm plans. So in this chart here, we can see in the past fortnight, did you make firm plans to attend the following activities? Um, and when we compare First Nations audiences on the right, so audiences for First Nations work, um, to other types of audiences, what we can see is that... Um, they're in slightly higher proportions are making firm plans to attend in future. So we can see um, across a range of different types of events that a, a larger proportion of this audience are active in thinking about the future. And we expect that these numbers will have moved 
um, somewhat in relation, you know, when we collect data again in a few weeks' time. Um, and obviously making plans is a, a range of different factors, you know, involved in that, including what's actually on sale. Um, so that's obviously going to be something that we're tracking really closely over the next few months. Um, so what we can see about First Nations audiences is that they're more likely to be making plans, but they're actually making them for a slighter later period. So they're planning a little bit further ahead than other audiences. And one of the things that's going on for, for audiences of First Nations work is that they're actually more likely to be experiencing um, financial impacts of the pandemic. So compared to other audience members, 43% um, have experienced a loss of household income as a result of the pandemic relative to 38% of other audiences. So um, this group, you know, partly because there are a lot of artists and arts workers in this group as well, um, they, there is a big proportion that are experiencing financial impacts. And so it's an important factor for us to consider as we think about re-engaging this audience segment, um, particularly because the financial impacts of the pandemic could well last longer than the health impacts. I mean, no one knows what's going to happen and Victoria's just extended the state of emergency. So who knows what's going to happen with the virus, but we know that um, the financial impacts of the pandemic aren't going to be resolved overnight. And so um, among this group, audiences for First Nations work, while there is very strong engagement um, with arts and culture and, you know, many people are starting to, well, some are starting to make plans more so than other audiences. We're seeing a, a large group, proportion of those audiences are experiencing financial impacts. So I think we need to think carefully about um, how we approach re-engagement and what we put on sale when, et cetera, and price points, um, all that kind of thing because of price sensitivity. Um, I want to talk now a little bit about online and what we were kind of talking about before, Wesley. So another of the reports that I'm going to show you online participation, let's have a look at that now. I'll just get it to load. All right, so, oh, no, 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 I'm not there yet. All right, so the first chart I'm going to display here in relation to participating online is during the past fortnight, have you participated in any of the following online or digital arts and culture experiences? And again, we can see that First Nations audiences are more likely than other types of audiences to be participating in a range of different online arts and culture experiences, um, including live events, um, pre-recorded video of a performances and of events, um, virtual exhibitions and museum or gallery tours um, and doing online classes and tutorials. So across a range of different types of online experiences, audiences for First Nations work are high, relatively highly engaged. Um, in terms of the proportion that have discovered a new artist, artwork or performance online, audiences for First Nations work are highly likely to be making discoveries themselves or they know someone who has. Um, and when we ask whether someone's doing online arts and cultural activities more often than they did before, again, we see a higher proportion of audiences for First Nations work who are engaging more frequently online than before the pandemic or much more frequently online. Um, and two thirds, like other audiences, two thirds of those who are engaging more online say they wanna continue after the pandemic ends. So um, there's a range of different, I guess, indicators about the strength of online markets. And, and some of those are um, about participation, other of them are financial, but um, in relation to making discoveries so we've heard that you know many people are making discoveries um, one of the things that we've noticed when we probed qualitatively about the discoveries that people are making is that um, first nations experiences with first nations work online uh, feature quite highly um, 
So, for instance, um, we heard a, a, hundreds of different examples and um, I'll actually be able to show you some more about how you can explore this data at the end. Um, but we've also heard that people are making discoveries they're highly likely to be making discoveries through major institutions like the Sydney Opera House, um, National Gallery of Victoria, for instance, National Gallery of Australia. So one person said, I loved watching the National Galleries of Australia's This Place Artist Series. Indigenous artwork fills my heart and I love listening to Indigenous stories. One in particular was memorable because it was from an art centre in Warman, WA, and that was the last road trip we did before the lockdown. Um, so there's a whole lot of examples like this where someone has um, been on a journey that started with a major institution and, and ended up um, with a smaller arts organisation or an individual artist. Um, and the same thing's happening through commercial galleries, less so, but um, major institutions are mentioned a lot, actually. And so, um, Wesley, I was kind of curious to ask you about um, what you think this means for the sector. It makes um, sense to me, really, Tandy, because I think that there's something about, well, who has the resources to actually create these online environments? It's, it's normally the big big organisations, like, like the Opera House. And, you know, you'll talk about Bangara a bit more in a second, I guess, but this, this idea of saying even Bangara, which is a major performing arts company, doesn't necessarily have the resources to make this work uh, digital on, on their own. They need assistance. And I think that, especially those in the audience today, if you're working for a large organisation, a, a, a company or a, 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 an art centre, it, it's worth thinking about what your role is in, in promoting and pushing First Nations art, artists and, and artwork. Because I think there's something to be said. I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated by this whole idea of the well-being as well, that, that people, the, the audiences for First Nations work, see it as part of their well-being, um, that the value is as much for how it sits in their body, how it makes them feel in terms of a spiritual connection or, or a warmth. Because I'm, I'm very interested in that and that these large organisations can play a bigger role perhaps. Or, you know, do we need more resources to a very starved First Nations um, art sector to make sure that we can take up some of that challenge ourselves? Because, you know, to be honest, I think there's, there's no First Nations company or art center in the country that's actually got the kind of resources to create these online environments that we seem to be benefiting from at the moment. Yeah, it sort of comes back to what we were talking about before about if there is this strong engagement and we are we need to do that long-term strategic thinking, what does that mean for how we invest as a sector and um, how do we follow up what people have already experienced um, and how do we support our small to medium sector and independence to be, you know, part of this, um, this online ecosystem? Yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated too about the, the entry points that, that this, um, the audience for First Nations work is incredibly engaged uh, and and they're, they're out there trying to find new activities, new artists, new work, that their, their engagement needs to be fed, not by precedent and what, what it's always been, but new things. And so the challenge, I think, for most organisations are to go, well, what's the thing that hasn't been shown yet? Or how can we, how can we be the, um, not taste makers necessarily, but how can you give a, a very engaged audience new new interesting things to to engage with because i feel that uh, yeah. often we get a bit scared you know a, a yeah. large organization gets scared and that the kind of commercial imperatives stop them from helping the audience grow a bit more too mm. so um for those uh, i'd love to hear in the chat if um you're thinking about digital distribution and what challenges perhaps you are experiencing or any ideas you've got about as a sector how we kind of make more of this um I think in terms of when I just mentioned one of the other ways we asked about this qualitatively was um, we asked people what was the most memorable arts and culture experience you've had um, during the pandemic or what made it memorable. And again, we had a, a lot of First Nations examples in that. I think 70 people mentioned Bangara um, and um, 
I, th I think what comes across in their comments is a few, few different things. I mean, one, I think the, the quality of that experience as an online experience um, was noted by some audience members. Um, and I, I, think, I think in a way, um, one of the reasons why we're hearing so many First Nations examples when we talk about memorable experiences is that to an extent audiences have been looking for meaning in this time and, um, you know, First Nations arts and culture has has delivered on that for audiences um, at this time. Um, and I think one of the things that we, we noticed is people sharing examples of how the online format has allowed them to share it with their networks or, or friends more easily than um, a physical experience. So we are seeing people um, share recommendations and um, engage in discussion and interpretation in their social networks, um, perhaps more so than they might do at a live in, in the physical world. Um, so I, I think there's that um, where there has been that room created for um, additional reflection and discussion and, and um, for that collective experience to be kind of uh, really um, brought brought out. So I know some people loved with Bangara being, you know, seeing other people's comments and feeling part of that global audience that was seeing something very, very special and unique. So um, yeah, there's lot there's lots going on. I want to show you some of the data now about the market. So what people are paying for. So um, in terms of just flipping back to the dashboard now. One of the things we noticed, so we know that well-being really came out um, among First Nations respondents, so people who are First Nations themselves. When we ask audiences for First Nations work about their motivations, one of the things that comes across most strongly is the desire to support things they think are important. Um, and so, um, you know, 47% of those who are engaging online um, say that, you know, part of their motivation is to support things they think are important. Um, when we look at the proportion who have paid for an online arts and culture experience, again, you can see that First Nations or so audiences for First Nations work are quite different to the other segments. They're much more likely to have paid um, for something they've experienced um, and all different types of payments, particularly donations. Um, so where things have been, experiences have been made available by donation or pay what you can, that kind of situation, um, audiences for First Nations work have been highly likely to go ahead and do that. Um, and they're more likely to have spent more basically, than other audiences. Um, so a higher proportion of First Nations, audiences for First Nations work have spent more than $50 or even more than $25. Um, and so I think there's some really good signs there for the potential market for this kind of work. Um, the extent to which we're, you know, realising that or will continue to realise that as the pandemic goes on, you know, who knows. Um, well, as you're saying, Tandy, too, this notion that, 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 that this group has been financially impacted, but they're still valuing the arts and still, you know, yeah, paying yeah. prices. Well, you go, oh, that's great. So let me just show you. We know that about, you know, just under half have been financially impacted. I'll get a little bit tricky now and show a different, another filter layered on top here, and then we'll take some questions, I think. So you can apply two filters at once. So we've already got First Nations um, compared to other types of arts and culture groups. Um, and what I'm going to do is put on top of that financial hardship from the pandemic as the second filter. So this is going to get a little bit busy, um, but I want to show you because what we're seeing in this data is that um, First Na audiences for First Nations work are highly likely to be um, paying, to be going online, experiencing things online and paying even if they've been, after you take into account the high number that's been financially impacted. So um, it's, it's quite amazing that um, this group, even though they've been experiencing this financially, they are, feel so strongly and engaged and supportive that they are still more likely to be paying than other audiences. They're not spending as much, which I'll show you. 
Um, but here we've got, so bear with me on this data, but on the right here, we've got our First Nations audience sample and they're split out into two groups, um, those who haven't lost household income and those who have. So you can see that those who um, have lost household income are actually very highly engaged still. They're actually doing more online um, and this is likely related to the fact there's so much free content online and they're making discoveries. Um, they're slightly, sorry, let me just find this. So when we look at the data about paying, they're also highly likely to be paying, um, although they're not spending as much. So um, the proportion that have spent over $50 among those who have lost household income um, is 33%. It's still, you know, on par or higher than other audience segments. Um, but those who um, audiences for First Nations work who haven't lost household income are particularly likely to be paying right now. So um, I think we all know people who um, haven't experienced any, you know, loss of household income right now. And they, um, you know, some of those people have told me that they feel a, a duty or an obligation to keep spending and to spend on things they think are important. So there's kind of um, people using their, their, their buying power and their, um, their income right now to support the causes that they um, are philosophically aligned with that they think are important and to see that continue. And we know that that's held very strongly among audiences for First Nations work. So um, I think, yeah, in combination, Wesley, the surprises in the data for me um, is that I didn't expect to find these two groups so to be so strongly kind of engaged with arts and culture generally um, and to be so ready to attend again. So I expected a bit more caution, mainly for health reasons, but I'm struck by how much the both of these groups um, want to attend again relative to other audiences and to find such an important and ongoing role for digital technology. So to help support the wellbeing of First Nations people, um, to enable audiences to discover and learn more about First Nations art and artists. Um, and as a revenue stream that I think we are, you know, partially realising already, but um, as the pandemic goes on and as well as the financial recession goes on, I think thinking about online as a way to maintain engagement with, you know, audiences for First Nations work, particularly since they have been financially impacted, I think digital technology is going to be a great tool for us to do that. Well, and we haven't talked yet about the, as soon as you go online, there's a great international audience too that you potentially tap into that, you know, that suddenly there's no borders on, on these digital um, Absolutely, environments. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's something we don't have visibility of in this data. This is just Australian audiences. So, yes, you're right. And, and as I was saying earlier about um, tourism, that tourism is such a, well, mostly you know, by domestic and international tourism, there's there's a lot of um, arts and cultural workers uh, in the First Nations environment working in tourism, and we're not we don't have much um, transparency there with this data either, do we? Um, sorry. Oh, like we, oh, we we can't actually see how how this is engaged in tourism or in in first nations arts experiences within the tourism market this is mostly um you know galleries performing yes. arts centers that kind of world yes. so it'd be interesting to see i mean it'd be interesting to see how um how, how those other sectors have fared and whether there's um a sense that it's all going to get a bit tricky i'm aware of the time and whether there's any crown questions as well um there's so much data here, so much to get, get into, Tandy. I just there can't... is, there is. And I'll show you for those interested if um, I'm sure we'll, we can come to some Q&A if there are any questions in a moment. But I will just show you on um, our website, um, the COVID-19 homepage, you can access a range of different fact sheets um, about online engagement, for instance, if that's something that interests you. And um, we've got different state and territory breakdowns. Um, and we've got um, performing arts and museums and galleries also available as um, fact sheets. And um, you can also, if you're thinking about, you know, how this relates to your context, you can access all the questions that were asked in the survey. Um, so if you're doing your own surveying and you're curious to benchmark, um, you can borrow some questions there. Um, 
and we're actually collecting ideas at the moment for the second phase of the research. So if anyone has any burning questions or things that haven't quite been um, explored in the first phase, please do get in touch with us. Um, drop us a note with your ideas about what you want to know more information about and we'll do our best um, try and take that on board as we go into the planning phase for the next data collection, which is early July. Um, and if you are in the dashboard, you can access the dashboard on our website here and there's a video tutorial there as well. Um, and we really encourage you to be sharing what you find. So this is a bit of an experiment for us. We're making all this data available um, before we've, you know, analysed it within an inch of its life. But um, on social media, if you can share what you're finding using the hashtag audience outlook monitor, that enables us as a sector to kind of get, get on top of things faster. So um, really keen to hear from you, what you found useful, what questions you've got and any ideas for the future. I'm fascinated by the idea of um, very engaged audiences like to be part of a First Nations environment as well. You know, some of the, the, the com conversations in the chat, just looking at, you know, how, how to engage more with local First Nations people and program more First Nations work, that there's a kind of, uh, well, if you have a, a, a supportive, engaged audience, that chances are they, they will want to engage with First Nations conversations as well, that they're, they're already there. I like the idea that they, this audience skews younger um, and is also more, more educated than anyone else. I like all that. <laughs> <We're> the, <laughs> yeah, those. like the proportion of audiences for First Nations work that have a postgraduate degree is like 50 something percent or something crazy. So um, it is, I think, um, <laughs> I think the, you know, future audience for this, for our First Nations arts and culture is, um, is very much linked with the quality of our education system. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a good discussion. We've got a, a question from Gary who's saying during the closure times, we quickly moved to creating online content and our uptake and views were high, but we are finding that as more content is now being produced, it has become very competitive and our views for online content has dropped off substantially. Just an observation that digital will need to be well planned and well prepared to keep in digital engagement. Yes, that makes sense. This yes. idea that that when it becomes more and more competitive, um, you, you you'll want a quality experience and things as well. Which is going back to the idea of you you were talking about the example of Bangara. You know, very beautiful um, work, very visually beautiful with lovely music and things, and then shot really lovely. Uh, beautifully as well so that there's it becomes a great uh, a great visual experience um online as well it's not it's not a rough and ready kind of exactly. single camera back kind of yeah thing. yeah so my view is almost less is more um like if we do less and invest you know at a higher quality i think that's a better move long term mm. Well, Judy Pippin was talking about um, she's uh, Black Diggers, which is a project I was in, involved in, which was about Aboriginal servicemen in World War One, and that we did a I think a four or five camera shoot of that, and that kind of toured as a streaming experience throughout. But we found that one of the biggest issues online was um, negotiating with unions and all of those kind of different factors as well. How to make sure that's built into contracts in a way that doesn't make it cost prohibitive. Um, and how do you look after the artists, but uh, also how do you get out there to different audiences as well? Carolyn Browns is asking a question here. The findings from this data offer an incredible incentive for continuing to provide First Nations content. Yes, it would be so useful to have a way for current and potential audiences for First Nations work to know about the smaller to medium companies and organisations such as Black Dance. How could this be facilitated? Wow, goodness. Carolyn, I, I think it's also the, the responsibility of um, large organisations to shine a light on all these small to medium, as you call them. You know, black dance is such a crucial um, dance uh, piece of infrastructure for black dance, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait dance here, and to shine a light on it. How does, in this case, Sydney Festival or Sydney Opera House or the Queensland Performing Arts Centre do that to sh shine a light on it? And I think, too, that often we'll need trusted brands and trusted names 
to help get us through there. I mean, what is the responsibility of something like uh, Sydney Dance Company or um, the Australian Dance Theatre to help promote uh, a First Nations environment as well, a First Nations set of works? And I think mm. that, you know, we can, we can talk about these partnerships more and more about, you know, what, what is, well, I see um, Jerry from, um, from MTC, like what is the role of MTC in promoting and um, partnering with Aboriginal theatre companies to help build um, this kind of work as well? Uh, yes, here we go. Sydney Opera House has a section in their weekly EDM uh, called From Our Friends could email and ask them to feature. Yes, absolutely, Eleanor. This idea of how you use your position to connect with the audience that wants to connect with this work. I mean, I mean, Tandy, I mean, I'm really quite fascinated at how loyal this audience is, how even when they're experiencing financial um, impacts, that they're still wanting to support the art. And that's fantastic. Yeah, that's so I, I think um, the desire is there. Um, and this group want to show their support. Um, so I think it's like how can, you know, I think that there's some useful ideas there for our messaging during this time. Um, we, want, we know that those who want to show their support have a, a bigger appetite for more information um, from artists and creatives associated with the organisation. So, you know, how can we be through our... Um, you know, EDMs through our social networks be fueling this appetite um, and providing people with the content or the offers potentially, even if they can't support them financially themselves, that they can pass them on and be influential in their social networks potentially. Um, so yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, cr cross marketing and cross promotions, obviously an opportunity and it's great that Sydney Opera House to, um, you know, promoting others and stuff like that. I think partnerships is, is obviously a really key um, potential. And as time goes on and we, we start to see um, some, some organisations and platforms becoming real gateways for audience members, I think that's going to be really, mm. um, it's going to be important for us to think about how we make the most of those. And um, from the point of view of the funding bodies, um, really how, uh, financial support is linked with um, the partnership working and collaborations. Um, it doesn't make sense for everyone to be becoming an online broadcaster, does it? I think that I don't think everyone needs to be doing it all of the time, but um, as a sector, I think I'd like to see um, less low value digital investment and, and yeah. more high value, even if it's a smaller number of things, but that yeah. they are really high value, um, really d deep partnerships well, um, that do support different parts of the sector. I think Grant, Grant Dodwell would agree with you there. He's been doing a lot of these. He's done nine productions so far with Australian Theatre Live, and he'd be saying, yep, yeah, got to keep the quality there. And also the Art Gallery in WA saying they've got a stimulus package um, over half a million dollars targeted for acquisitions from artists. And I'm fascinated too. I read an article on the Sydney Morning Herald recently around the number of books on racism and on race that have just sold out all over the place too. And when we come back to this idea of well-being, that the arts are really our window onto our society and help us create a vocabulary for that shifts and changes. And I don't think, you know, though we've got the, the pandemic, we've also had the Black Lives Matter um, period of time in this last, let's call it, month. And I, I, I can't wait to see what the new lot of data comes back with, whether, in fact, that's had some impact. Because um, you were saying that this, this data was from March and whether, in fact, the last month or so, there'll be um, new data seeing, seeing more people engaging or not with online First Nations storytelling. Be interesting yes, absolutely. Yeah, so this data is from May, which um, predates the Black Lives Matter um, uh, and so, um, yeah, give us a few weeks. We'll give you an up-to-date picture. I mean, this data also predates the announcement of many reopenings. So um, I think we're going to start to see um, a bit more and have a bit more nuance between the relationship between physical attendance and online. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly in terms of physical attendance, although, you know, there is a, 
a decent segment that say they're ready to attend, I think in the short term we are likely to see, um, you know, I think people are going to be very, quite cautious. There's a sense of wait and see, which we talk about in some of the other fact sheets, but um, people are, you know, a big big group out there are waiting to see what happens. And um, with the financial impacts of the pandemic, we're certainly going to see a drop in um, frequency of attendance and spend on, on physical events. So um, these are conditions that we're going to be working with in the, over, you know, the medium to long term. So I think um, as time goes on, we're, we're going to need to understand a bit more deeply the relationship between physical attendance and online and how that is all working. So um, we'll start to unpick that a little bit in our data collection in early July. So if you'd like to register for updates, um, you can pop on over to our website and down the bottom there is a subscribe for updates section if you're not already. Um, and if you just click COVID-19 Audience Outlook Monitor, you'll be the first to hear about um, new results. Um, and it, yes, if you do have any ideas for us about phase two, please do get in touch. Great. Uh, well, that's our time, I think. So, Tandy, yeah. thank you so much. Really thoughtful. Yeah. Hand over to you, Chris. Yeah, thanks so much, both. Yeah, huge thanks to both Wesley and Tandy um, and to all of you who have participated in this, yeah, this really valuable discussion today. Um, if you have any further questions or comments, as Tandy said, you can reach out to both Pattern Makers and Australia Council. You should be able to see some email addresses on your on the screen now. Yeah, um, the slides uh, and a recording of today's session will be available soon um, that you can share, and you'll also find all of the other fact sheets, uh, the national snapshot report, and access to the dashboard on both the Pattern Makers website and the Australia Council website. And as Tandy said, we do encourage you to, um, to explore that dashboard and, and come up with your own insights and share them with us. Um, next week's webinar will have a focus on fundraising, support and marketing. Um, and that will take place next Monday, uh, 29th of June at the same time, 11 a.m. You'll be able to register for that webinar now. Uh, and as Tandy said, uh, our team will be checking back in with the audiences uh, with two more stages of the audience outlook monitor research scheduled for July, just, uh, just a few weeks away the next stage, uh, and then later in September as well. So we'll be able to keep track on, on, on how things have shifted as uh, restrictions ease further and, um, and institutions reopen. Uh, so keep your eye on our websites and social feeds for more info uh, on that shortly. Thanks once again to Wesley and Tandy and goodbye for now. Bye everyone, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, thanks. <laughs>